So good morning and thank you all for joining us for Eye on the Economy today. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic has had very deep and profound impacts on business and on our economy. And as we prepare for a potential second wave of the pandemic, the Chamber in partnership with our members and thought leaders is delighted to be hosting a three-part expert webinar series that is designed to keep our members and the broader business community informed on the latest economic trends and also to provide you with the knowledge and the resources necessary to forge through this very, very turbulent time. And so today for our first episode in the Eye on the Economy series, we are delighted to be featuring TD Canada Trust economist Omar Abdelrahman. He's going to be sharing some key insights about the impacts of COVID-19 on our national, provincial and local economies, some key trends, as well as what's in store beyond the pandemic. Omar has a very, very distinguished background. He joined the TD Economics team in 2018, where his primary responsibilities include analyzing and forecasting Canada's regional economies and commodity markets. Certainly a challenge during a global pandemic, suffice to say. And he's a regular contributor to a wide variety of TD's economic publications, covering all aspects of the Canadian economy, including commodities and oil markets. And he has, uh, in addition to his career at TD, he was previously with the Bank of Canada's Financial Stability Department. He holds a Master of Financial Economics from the University of Toronto, and also a degree in economics from Queen's University. So Omar, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very much looking forward to your presentation and we'll have some time for questions at the end. So with that, over to you. Thanks very much, Carla, my pleasure. Um, and thank you everyone, good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Um, my goal for today's presentation is to um, cover what uh, we've been seeing in terms of the latest economic developments, how they've been affecting our um, economic outlook for the year um and uh what they mean uh for the economy going forward uh, the focus of the presentation will be on um, canada's economy and some of the regional nuances specifically within ontario um, having said that i will divide uh, the presentation into two sections uh, starting with a global overview uh, or a global outlook uh, the nature of the pandemic is it's a, it's a global pandemic. It's a global economic um, hit affecting um, all countries globally. And so setting the tone with, um, with that global outlook will then um, um, give way to um, uh, the more specifics uh, relevant to Canada's economy. Um, so uh, as, as always, I'm very happy to uh, take any questions after uh the presentation um and thank you again for joining us today uh so Lindsay, if we can move to the next slide please um we know that the pandemic has affected uh lives and livelihoods greatly it's also introduced unprecedented um economic uncertainty um and has sent most countries uh, globally into deep economic uh recessions Based on what we're seeing in the data, we now expect global economic growth to contract by a substantial 3.8% in 2020. The impact is uh, widespread uh, across most economies. Uh, we know that uh, some of the advanced economies specifically in Europe, uh, like Italy, France, and Spain are expected to weather uh, the biggest contractions, some of the biggest contractions this year as well as some emerging market economies um, as well. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, China, despite facing the earliest economic hit, is expected to end 2020 with positive economic growth. A strong contraction in the first quarter of the year in China gave way to a very strong rebound, specifically on the industrial side. And so we have a bit of a wedge between advanced economies steep contractions in Europe, um, steep but lesser contractions in North America, that is the US and Canada, steep contractions in emerging economies, but China ending the year with positive growth. Now, 
it's important to take a step back and um, note that China's 2.5 expected growth this year uh, is still much lower than its uh, than its trend growth and what otherwise would have been forecasted um, had there not uh, been a pandemic. Um, so moving on to the next slide. One feature defining this pandemic is that it's been uneven across countries. It's been uneven across sectors. And as we see from this um, chart, um, many of the hardest hit categories are those involving um, high touch areas or close contact areas, specifically travel, some entertainment industries. Um, at the same time, we've seen a much lesser hit on um, some areas like grocery uh, and food stores uh, or home renovations. Um, and again, that global context will set the stage for what we've been seeing in Canada um, as well. So moving on to the next slide. We also know that the recovery has been uneven across countries. As uh, stated previously, um, we know that the heaviest contractions are expected to be seen in uh, parts of Europe that had the stringent lockdown measures at the onset of the pandemic. We also know that um, Canada lies somewhere in between, um, expected to perform slightly better than Italy, uh, Spain, and some other European countries, but uh, somewhat worse than uh, the United States um, and some countries in Asia, specifically China, but also countries like Japan. Uh, now, looking at this chart uh, or this uh, slide, um, comparing uh, the right uh, chart, the right hand chart, and the left hand chart also shows us the uneven contractions and recoveries across uh, the industries. In advanced economies, we've seen a very strong decline in retail sales. But it was also followed by um, strong rebounds. Now, on the other hand, industrial production has rebounded um, much um, slower in most advanced economies. On the flip side, China had the opposite story. The consumer side, that is um, sectors like retail sales, have rebounded much more slowly than industrial production which was heavily supported by uh, China's um, stimulus efforts uh, to combat the pandemic. So moving on, what are we seeing now? We know that we've seen a very strong rebound over the summer. It was widespread across most countries and sectors. More recently, we know that virus case counts, daily case counts have been rising to levels higher than what they were at the onset of the pandemic. And while we're not out of the woods yet, and it's still very uncertain, we haven't seen um, the same increase in death rates as of yet. Now, the reasons for this are still uncertain and are beyond the discussion in this presentation. But the conclusion seen in most countries thus far is that those emerging second waves have not led to widespread lockdowns like those seen in the March and April time period. And so in the right chart, in the right hand side chart, um, we haven't seen um, a very steep decline in consumer engagement or mobility indicators similar to what we saw back in March. However, uh, moving to the next slide, we do know based on these high frequency indicators that while they haven't reversed steeply, they have stalled. So on the left side, we see the total number of flights, of course, one area that's been very heavily impacted by the pandemic. And we see a bit of a leveling off since late August. Similarly, Restaurant reservation data is showing some stalling or even a slight pullback as we head into the autumn. 
Well, the reasons for this are multiple. Some countries have, instead of instituting widespread lockdowns again, have instituted more targeted uh, restrictions. Usually these very targeted um, restrictions are focused on uh, areas like restaurants and bars or high gathering areas. But at the same time, consumers are also becoming likely more cautious uh, amid uh, rising uh, case counts. Moving ahead to the next slide. What does this mean going forward? We know that the low hanging fruit has been picked for the most part. Our expectation is that we continue on that road to recovery going forward, but it will be more choppy and uneven than we have seen over the summer. We do know that the path to recovery uh, depends heavily on a path, the path of the virus, which in turn depends on either a vaccine or a widely available uh, treatment or changes in the course of um, how uh, the virus affects individuals. And so going forward, we expect the recovery to be more uneven, slow, and choppy relative to what we've seen over that strong rebound period in the summer. Now, moving to the next slide. Before moving to Canada, I wanna highlight one uniting theme that's been common across most economies um, in the, uh, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is the unprecedented economic contraction has been met with an equally unprecedented government response. Uh, we've seen um, very strong responses fiscally, monetary policy, and on the regulatory side across many economies, including Canada. But these fiscal policy supports included income and bridge supports, tax deferrals, loan guarantees. We also saw central banks engage in both conventional and unconventional monetary policy by lowering rates to their effective lower bound and engaging in some quantitative easing exercises, that is asset purchase programs. At the same time, we've seen some macroprudential regulations are relaxing banks' capital requirements. Moving to the next slide. Bank of Canada was one of the central banks um, engaging in some of these um, monetary policy efforts uh, to um, support the recovery process um, and prevent financial market stress from being amplified uh, at the onset of the pandemic. That includes on the left-hand side, significant asset purchase programs. At the same time, Bank of Canada lowered its overnight borrowing rate to its effective lower bound. In its recent communications and monetary policy reports, the bank has also um, highlighted that the effective lower bond, that is the lower interest rate, is expected to last for a long time going forward until economic slack has been fully absorbed and until inflation returns to its 2% uh, target for a sustained period of time. So we do expect uh, the overnight rate to remain low for at least the next uh, two years, if not more. Now moving to the next slide. We know that these policy measures have helped significantly ease financial market stress, including in Canada. Moving forward, the next one. And those uniting themes end our discussion on the global backdrop um, that uh, sets the stage for uh, what we're seeing in Canada. Moving to Canada, turning to the Canadian economy, we know that Canada, we've mentioned that before, we expect it to lie somewhere in between uh, in the middle of the pack. Uh, performance is expected to be uh, better than some of the European economies that saw very stringent uh, restrictions at the onset of the pandemic. Uh, 
but again, is expected to be slightly worse than that seen uh, in the United States and some emerging economies. Now, the reason for this is Canada had slightly more uh, stringent restrictions than the US did in uh, March and April, but Canada also had uh, the compounded effect of an oil price shock. And as a net oil exporter, Canada saw um, oil prices and oil incomes received by oil producers decline. Um, at the same time, oil production was also heavily impacted as well. Moving to the next slide. What we've been seeing since our June forecast is um, actually a, an improvement in indicators over the summer relative to what we were expecting. So what we see on the chart is uh, the level of GDP and the second quarter that is where the bulk of the economic hit was seen um, came in slightly worse than expected. However, since then, uh, the rebound has been um, stronger than expected based on uh, the higher frequency indicators that we've been seeing. Uh, and we do expect that to continue going forward, uh, given the stronger than expected um, handoff uh, going forward to uh, the fourth quarter of the year. So moving forward, again, within Canada, the recovery has been uh, uneven. What we see here is the percentage of jobs recovered by August that were lost from the pandemic. We see the disproportionate impact that the pandemic had on some industries like transportation and warehousing. Um, of course, air travel is one key area there, but also ground travel because of reduced tourism. Uh, business support services. Uh, we, we know, of course, that the mining and oil and gas sector has been very heavily impacted by the oil price shock. Um, and other um, sectors that rely heavily on uh, large gatherings, uh, like information and cultural and recreational activities. But the hit from the pandemic and the consequent recovery has also been uneven across other areas. We know that um, the proportion of jobs lost was more, more heavily concentrated in low paying jobs, low income earners. We also know that the recovery uh, in employment rates has been uh, quicker or, um, or more robust for males than it has been for females, as we see on the right uh, hand side. Moving to the next slide. One key area uh, differentiating this uh, downturn from other downturns is that despite the turmoil that we've seen in on the gross domestic product side, on the labor market side, uh, we haven't seen uh, a hit or uh, a similar hit to incomes. In fact, uh, incomes have remained relatively steady. And as we see on the left-hand side, uh, that is the level of income. And the key differentiator here is um, net government transfers. Typically, net government tra transfers are a net negative uh, for total income. But because of all the government support measures, um, namely CERB, uh, which we're going to discuss uh, later, uh, we saw that incomes were not um, as heavily or were not impacted uh, when compared to gross domestic product and labor markets. Um, and that differentiating factor has, in fact, led to uh, stronger than expected reboundaries, rebounds across some consumer spending indicators. As we see on the right-hand side, retail sales posted a very strong V-shaped rebound, uh, and they're now back above their pre-pandemic levels. And a key, again, a key factor that's expected to have supported this is uh, the um, uh, the fact that income has been relatively unscathed uh, throughout the pandemic. Moving to the next slide. Of course, the most um, known uh, form of income support from the from the government has been uh, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or CERB. Um, now, towards the end of August, uh, we know that some of these uh, that the program has been um, adjusted 
Uh, and we know that going forward, it's going to involve, instead of having the usual CRB program, which, um, which had slightly different re restrictions than typical employment insurance programs, was a bit more relaxed uh, with respect to some um, areas like uh, the requirement to uh, actively engage in seeking uh, employment or past employment um, uh, history. Uh, but we know that the, that the government has emphasized that going forward, uh, income supports will remain to those affected by COVID-19. Uh, that includes a slight adjustment to uh, the employment insurance program um, by raising the uh, floor to 500 uh, per week. Um, it also includes added programs like the Canada Recovery Benefit and the Canada Recovery uh, Caregiving uh, and Sickness Benefit to individuals that would not typically be covered by employment insurance programs, like those self-employed, for example, or anyone who um, has to care for others or uh, be absent from work due to COVID-related illnesses. I'm moving to the next slide. I want to zoom in a bit on the regional aspects of um, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in Canada. One aspect that we've been seeing in the data repeatedly is that the larger provinces have been more susceptible to uh, the uh, economic hit from COVID-19. We know that case counts in general adjusted by population have been much higher or um, even the COVID -19, the entire COVID-19 curve has been um, more, uh, more severe in the larger provinces, namely Ontario and Quebec than it has been in some of the smaller provinces in Atlantic Canada or the prairies. Um, now, of course, they are that's all in relative terms. If we compare these COVID-19 curves to other countries, uh, they, uh, they would, for example, to the United States, uh, these uh, case counts adjusted by population would be much lower. Um, however, uh, I use that chart to set the tone for the upcoming slides, which will show um, a slightly higher economic impact on these larger provinces. If we move to the next slide, this is the labor market picture as of August, uh, and it shows employment relative to February 2020 levels. Uh, we know that Alberta, of course, has the compounded effect of COVID-19 uh, and the oil price shock. Uh, but we also know that Ontario and BC are uh, still one of the um, provinces that have had uh, steeper uh, contractions in employment um, and at the same time slower recoveries. Meanwhile, provinces, smaller provinces like New Brunswick, Manitoba and Saskatchewan have seen uh, a relatively lesser hit uh, from, uh, from the pandemic unemployment. Um, of course, exceptions exist. Um, Quebec being one, Quebec had by far the steepest contractions in March and April, given their more stringent lockdowns, but they've also had a very strong recovery after that, uh, that was prompted by earlier reopening plans. And the explanation for this is, 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 uh, is multifold, but it, it rests on the assumption that COVID-19 curves um, set the stage for uh, the economic contraction and consequent recovery. Uh, lower case counts uh, have resulted in earlier reopening plans and more comfort by governments to relax restrictions, but also comfort by consumers and businesses to engage in economic activity. Moving to the next slide. The chart shows our GDP projections as of September uh, for the provinces. Now, again, I mentioned that exceptions exist and Newfoundland uh, is expected to have the steepest construction uh, despite not facing as um, um, uh, uh, higher case counts as some of the larger provinces did. Again, the oil price shock leaves some provinces like Alberta and Newfoundland with a disproportionate impact. Ontario, Ontario is expected to come in slightly similar to Canada's overall macroeconomic outlook. Um, we 
we haven't revised forecasts given the emerging, uh, uh, potentially uh, emerging second waves as of yet. These forecasts are as of September. Um, however, uh, we do expect uh, at least so far um, restrictions or newly enacted restrictions have been more targeted and are thus not expected to affect our outlook significantly um, uh, going forward. But again, Quebec and Ontario stand to be most at risk from these renewed restrictions. And so there is a potential for us to possibly downgrade uh, these uh, further relative to Canada uh, going forward. And moving to the next slide. I know there may be some interest in some of the local nuances within Ontario. Um, and one, uh, one theme that's been emerging, uh, not just in Ontario, but throughout the country is that the larger CMAs, similar to the theme that we're seeing in the larger provinces, is the larger CMAs are witnessing um, uh, larger hits to economic activity, uh, namely uh, labor market activity. Um, now, the, Local data at the CMA level is more volatile, so I do caution against uh, reaching uh, solid or very robust conclusions from these data. But we have seen it across Quebec, uh, BC, um, Alberta, and Ontario, and that is the largest CMAs, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, um, Calgary, and Edmonton, uh, have seen uh, larger hits uh, relative to their smaller CMA counterparts within their respective provinces. So in this chart, we see that employment and uh, the unemployment rate in Toronto as of now uh, is, uh, is the highest across the CMAs in Ontario. Moving to the next slide. Um, last topic I wanna um, zoom in on is housing markets. Now, housing activity has been one of the areas that has seen um, the strongest uh, rebounds uh, during the economic recovery. We saw very strong V-shaped snapbacks in uh, existing home sales over the summer and home building activity. And that was broad-based. That was broad-based across the country, uh, across uh, all, all provinces. And moving to the next slide. There are several reasons for this. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, it's broad based across uh, most regions. So this chart shows again, um, existing home sales rebounding um, to above pre-pandemic levels in both Ontario and in the Hamilton Burlington um, economic region. Um, there are, uh, there, the reasons for this are multifold. Uh, one, some of the spring, uh, typically strong spring activity has been disrupted by um, the onset of the pandemic in March and April. So there was a lot of significant pent up demand that was released in the summer as restrictions were eased and as case counts declined. At the same time, we know that the hit to uh, labor markets has been um, more centered in uh, lower wage um, uh, occupations. Uh, these Now these, um, uh, occupations and, uh, and individuals that were most impacted on the labor market front um, typically constitute uh, a lower percentage of home ownership uh, individuals and uh, typically have a higher proportion of, uh, of rent uh, compared to home ownership. So that labor market hit um, was not uh, translated to uh, a, a consequent uh, or subsequent housing market hit. And of course, income support measures were there as well. Um, and of course, one uh, one other driver has been the uh, downshift in interest rates uh, that we saw uh, over that period as well that reduced borrowing costs. Now, moving to the next slide, do we do we expect that strength to continue? Um, it's unlikely, it's unlikely that we, what we saw over the summer, that very strong V-shaped rebound will sustain. Um, and there are two key reasons for this. One is more near term, and that is um, pent-up demand has likely been partially exhausted at least. 
We also know that this increase in uh, activity over the summer has resulted in a uh, subsequent increase in prices, uh, thereby lowering affordability. So we do view as, uh, this um, worsened, slightly worsened affordability as, uh, as a hindrance to, um, to, uh, to sustaining that level of activity going forward. Um, at the same time, uh, from a longer term perspective, we know that uh, population growth has been heavily impacted by the pandemic. There's been restrictions on international immigration, which has been a key driver in Canada's strong population growth in the past two years. Um, and that eventually is expected to feed through to uh, some impacts on housing demand. Moving to the next slide. Um, uh, and this chart reflects the disconnect that we saw that I mentioned before between the income side of the economy and the GDP and the labor market side of the economy. Uh, it's something that we mentioned in our previous economic outlook, and that is that uh, housing activity based on unemployment would have been much lower than um, what we saw. Um, uh, and that is, again, a key consequence of um, the fact that income, uh, the income side of the equation has not been impacted. Now to conclude, uh, moving to the next slide, uh, what do we expect going forward? We do expect, as we mentioned um, from a global perspective, uh, that the next phase uh, of the recovery will be slow and uneven. In terms of high frequency indicators, we are seeing some stalling or leveling off in many indicators. On the left-hand side, we see uh, some responses from the uh, CFIB Small Business Survey. And uh, we do see that um, while things have been improving, they are the rate at which they've been improving has been slowing down. That includes plans to, uh, to increase hiring. It includes um, you know, concerns about insufficient domestic demand. Uh, and so these uh, going forward, we do expect some of these um, uh, headwinds to uh, act uh, as a drag on growth. We don't expect a reversal, but as the right-hand side chart shows, we do expect that after that strong summer rebound, the next phase of the recovery would be more elongated um, and potentially choppy along the way um, going forward. And on that note, I uh, would like to end the presentation and of course, very happy to take um, any questions uh, at the end. So thank you very much for listening and for joining today. Thank you, Omar. A very, very interesting presentation. I'm sure that there are many on the line who have questions. I'm going to suggest uh, to those who are making up our audience today that if you do have a question, uh, feel free to send a message through the chat function uh, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll make sure that we call on you systematically. We'll ask you to unmute at that time. So you don't need to include your question in the chat, just indicate that you'd, you'd like an opportunity to pose one to Omar. We also have Chris Brown from TD on the line as well. So he may also wanna participate in that conversation or discussion. So while we're waiting for others to chime in, I, I actually would like to ask a question, Omar. In, in reading so much about what economic recovery is going to look like. Um, we've heard a variety of letters of the alphabet used to characterize what recovery might look like. We've heard V-shaped, we've heard U-shaped, uh, we've had some liken it to the Nike swoosh in terms of what we can expect to see. Um, if we get a second wave of the pandemic, is it going to be W-shaped? I, I'd love to hear from you about your thoughts on that, because many of us are not only trying to consider what has happened, but to predict what may happen as we move forward. Absolutely. Uh, so our baseline projection is that of a, like you mentioned, the, the, the Nike smooth shaped uh, uh, recovery. Um, and uh, as highlighted throughout the presentation, we. We do expect uneven recoveries across sectors. So that's where the K comes in, um, uh, potentially. Uh, and 
but the Nike, the, the, the swoosh shaped recovery is expected to characterize uh, the overall uh, macroeconomic backdrop uh, uh, given the pandemic. Um, we don't embed a W shaped uh, recovery in our forecast, at least as of yet. Uh, we don't expect uh, renewed restrictions from what we've been seeing globally. Um, the rise in case counts that that, uh, that we are seeing across several uh, economies that's been happening since uh, the end of the summer uh, has not resulted in um, in widespread lockdowns like what we saw in March and April. It is resulting in some targeted uh, restrictions on some sectors. So um, so it, it is it is possible that the recovery may um, slow down or hit a standstill uh, during some months going forward. Um, but we don't expect that W shape where we have a double dip or you know a similar contraction to what we saw in, in Q2 of this year, which was which was unprecedented. Um, so yeah, uh, the swoosh shape would be the best way to describe our baseline forecast. And of course, we're constantly monitoring indicators and government reactions to uh, see if uh, if that outlook warrants uh, change or not. Great, thank you. Uh, does anyone on the line have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Oh. Tamar, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. If you wanna take yourself off mute and- um, Thanks, Carla. That would be great. Can you, can you hear me all right? can perfectly thank you okay thank you thank you omar uh, very good presentation first of all i'd like to ask if uh, we'd be able to have those slides handy to take a, a longer and uh you know more look at it uh to get a little bit more understanding if it's possible uh as far as getting the copy of the presentation at some time right um your comments obviously hit on the real estate market which has been you know declared an essential service in ontario and other provinces and uh, obviously we've seen uh, um, that v-shape take place and uh, we observed that uh, our spring market that typically would have been you know right at COVID declaration and the pandemic uh, uh, starting stage has been shifted by about three months. And you're absolutely correct about that pent up demand that was continuing at the beginning of the year has basically been stalled for about two or three months. And then it just went crazy as we, as we see. Uh, and a good example of that is uh, typically June 30 is the busiest time of year for lawyers. And it was shifted to September 30. So <laughs> a lot of people have, are moving in the last couple of days. So. Uh, um, now, on uh, the recent um, pro projections by CMHC, uh, initially it predicted a significant decline across the country, uh, somewhere between 9 to 18%, which was a very aggressive expectation and an estimate. Um, and obviously that proved to be the reverse over the last few months. And then they're still continuing to make um, projections of some significant drops in prices. Um, I, I agree with your uh, expectation that the pricing will probably, you know, level off somewhat from what we've seen in the last few months because the pent-up demand may have been coming to a meeting and the low interest rates have certainly bring in a lot of the, those renters into the ownership market. Um, do you see their numbers to be a reasonable number? I, I asked CMHC specifically if there are any actual numbers that, you know, facts that they can base that projection on, because that's a moving yardstick for, pretty much for a lot of people. Uh, and it can put a significant panic into the confidence of the real estate market. Um, and if it wasn't for the real estate market, I think we would have seen, you know, significant economic downturn. I think uh, every home that sells injects, you know, a significant amount of money into the economy, as you mentioned, like hardware stores and Home depots and everything else and home renovations are, are, are you know, being put back into the economy. Um, if there was a measuring stick, if you would say, is there going to be, you know, a leveling off, a slight projection in market values or, you know, a decline or a sharp decline in market values? What do your, what does your experience uh, anticipate? Yes, so we, we do we do anticipate uh, that um, 
in the next in the upcoming quarter specifically there will be some moderation in activity and we expect price growth to be virtually muted over next year that's on an annual average basis um, and again um while we don't we don't expect a strong reversal uh we do uh we do anticipate that a lot of the strong activity that was seen over the summer is um is likely to it's not uh going to be sustained going forward mm -hmm. um, so that uh, our, our base projection for next year is that um home prices are um going to be virtually flat now there is a compositional factor in this so um, uh, based on uh, what we're seeing across the region uh, so some of the movement away from um from uh, condos for example to single detached that may be impacting prices um, upwards uh, but we do we do anticipate uh, we definitely do anticipate some moderation going forward and in the near term we expect a bit of a you know a bit of a uh, you know uh, a pullback uh, so mm -hmm. thank you Are there any other questions from the audience? Well, while people are, are thinking about questions they might like to pose, uh, I wanted to ask, Omar, you touched on it in the presentation, uh, the, the fiscal stimulus, the support programming that's being offered to Canadians. How important is that going to be longer term, you know, in terms of supporting our recovery? There obviously have been adaptations to programming. It's been a, an extremely challenging time for governments in designing programs and policies to target relief. You know, we've heard the term, you know, unprecedented, uncharted, building the plane as we're flying it. And so many of these programs have evolved in response to changing circumstances and feedback that government has received from stakeholders. Can you give us a bit of a sense or share with us some of your thoughts about you know what the what the role that is going to play or should play in our economic recovery moving forward. Absolutely. Um, so we know that, uh, at least in comparing this, uh, this economic downturns, that the uh, the rebound that we saw in some of the consumers indicators specifically has been much stronger than anticipated. Um, and again, was uh, the that were uh, introduced by the government were uh, a key uh, factor supporting this. Uh, again, we know based on the economic data that we received for the second quarter uh, uh, that income has not, uh, you know, has not seen um, a hit that you would typically expect um, in a downturn. Uh, and again, a key contributing factor was these uh, in the government transfers or uh, the, uh, the bridge support programs. Um, the measures, the adjustments that were implemented uh, by the end of the summer and the beginning of the autumn to the employment insurance program and the two added programs, the Canada Recovery Benefit and the uh, Caregiver Benefit that were introduced are expected to maintain that support uh, for a period of time, um, and uh, we, however, we know that the employment insurance program runs for a period. I think it was of 26 months, um, something along that range. So, at some point in, uh, perhaps in the in the first half of next year, um, some of these income support measures may wane. Uh, and so that's where we could start to see some reductions in income. Uh, we definitely, um, we are cognizant of that. And uh, at the same time, it's important to note, of course, that um, you know, these measures were critical in, in preventing the downturn from being amplified or from resulting in you know, a W or, or a double dip recession or uh, impacting consumer confidence further. Uh, that would end up in a self-reinforcing cycle, worsening uh, the current downturn. 
Uh, however, of course, uh, they do come uh, with a hefty bill. So uh, we know that the deficit has increased substantially and so has government debt. So going forward, um, at some point, it's not expected that these programs will continue uh, forever. And as I mentioned, uh, some point in the first half of next year, some of these uh, employment insurance supports may start to wane. And at that point, we may see some reaction from the consumer spending side uh, or you know, more precautionary um, uh, behavior from, uh, from uh, on the consumer spending side. Great, thank you. Um, we do have two questions that I received. So I'm gonna invite John Whitaker to pose a question followed by Rick Burgess. Um, thank you, Carla, can you hear me? Okay. Perfectly, thank you, John. Okay. Uh, thank you, Omar. Um, Two questions. In one of your earliest charts, you showed on the negative side agriculture um, employment. I can't remember if it was overall production, where it was the only one on the left side of the chart. And I'm wondering why that was in particular. That's the first question. So that's an interesting dichotomy. Um, we the agriculture sector has actually, from a GDP perspective, has not been uh, severely impacted from the pandemic. That's on the gross domestic product side. Uh, we also know that um, you know demand for food products, crops, both internationally and domestically, has been um, has actually increased, if anything. Um, and uh, we saw that in in, uh, in agricultural exports from uh, some of the prairie provinces, like Saskatchewan, for example, which have shot up significantly this year. Uh, so on the gross domestic product side, we know that the agricultural sector is still uh, holding up. Uh, well, um, and um, and the same thing can be said. Of course, we don't have the full production crop production picture yet, but uh, but um, but yields are so far not expected to be uh, you know significantly worsened compared to previous years. We um, that employment hit to agriculture. Um, it, it's not too clear um, why uh, that is the case. I can I, I can look into it and get back to you. Um, but there were, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, at least anecdotally, uh, media reports suggesting that there were difficulties in uh, in, um, in, uh, in retaining or uh, or uh, or gaining uh, some of some of the foreign employment that is associated with uh, with agriculture, uh, given the pandemic-related restrictions on travel. So that could be one reason, um, and another reason could be. Uh, the, the cannabis industry is typically lumped in with uh, with agriculture, so uh, so um, so that that could be one area that saw um, uh, reductions. However, um, I don't have the full breakdown of this, so I can look into it and get back to you. Uh, again, these explanations are more uh, my um, my my best estimate of what uh, of what happened to agricultural employment. Okay, thank you. I, I do know, I deal with a number of farmers in agricultural um, areas, and I do know that in early March and April, there was a lot of concern about uh, foreign immigrant labor being able to come in, but that seemed to have been resolved. And uh, there are obviously uh, outbreaks of the COVID and so forth, but generally that seemed to have been resolved. And the, the other aspect of it was, I guess, is that when the restaurant industry shut down uh, immediately, there were many farmers, like the beef farmers and so forth, who were impacted in the shorter term, but uh, I am curious to see about that because that seemed to have been resolved. My second question is really relates to the commercial uh, sector, if you will. There was a lot of talked about about the residential side, but I know that on the commercial side, I'm a commercial real estate broker, so that's the reason for the question, is that people talk, all the major lenders talk about availability of funds, but nobody's really lending. However, having said that, I would, uh, suggest to the audience that the TD, it seems to be one of the few that's out there doing something. So that's uh, very positive. I have a couple of clients who uh, have uh, been just dealing with TD and have been, been quite happy with their response. So that's a positive, but how do you forecast the commercial lending market? Never mind interest rates, because if you can't get money, it doesn't matter what the interest rate is. Where do you see that as a component of our ability to growth and rebound? Sorry, can you um? So, are you are you looking more at the like the, the commercial real estate sector or 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 commercial lending specifically? 
Well, it, they really impact, they're together, really. I mean, I'm in the commercial real estate sector, but it is the ability for companies to borrow money to grow or to respond or to survive. So it's really, this, in my opinion, it's the same thing, the ability to borrow money. So I can, I can comment more on the you know, commercial, commercial real estate in general. Uh, not on the lending side. I will leave that to someone. Um, I would leave that to someone who's more um, uh, uh, on that side of the business. Uh, so I focus uh, purely on the economic outlook side. Um, now, commercial real estate we know is one. It's still and it still is one wild card, um, and uh, and that is again one of the one of the areas weighing on. The outlook is that increased uncertainty. There are many sectors where the post-COVID-19 landscape is still um, is still a wild card. Uh, that includes, uh, you know, the, the oil and gas sector is one, or air travel, commercial real estate is another. Um, I think, like a very brief uh, answer would be that you know some some of the some components of commercial real estate are, are here to stay, and we don't expect them to uh, to you know evaporate uh, or demand for that uh, for those components to evaporate. Um, but um, but but again, it's uh, it's still it is a wild card sector, uh, and the like the uncertainty uh, within that sector is is higher than than others. Okay, I, I guess that's an answer of sorts. No, and I appreciate yeah. it's difficult to really give a strong answer because there is a lot of uncertainty and that, that remains the challenge. So thank you for those comments. Thank you, John. Uh, Rick, would you like to pose your question? Thank you, Carlin. And uh, Omar, let me add my thanks to you for this morning's presentation. My question is about the government's uh, commercial rent support program. When it was introduced, we had a uh, chamber information session about that and some other programs. And I recall Carla quite correctly, I think, identifying and acknowledging the rent support program as being landlord driven. We know it's had a, a relatively modest uptake. I'm wondering whether you have any uh, projections on the level of particularly small business insolvencies that we might see over, say, the next six to 12 months that could be uh, largely driven by difficulties in paying rent? And secondly, do you have any sense of whether the government has any thoughts of modifying that program to make it more effective than it has been? Sure, uh, so on, on the second question, I, I'm not entirely sure if, if there are plans to, to modify the program uh, from its current format. However, um, on the um, on the business on the small business front, while I, while I cannot comment on uh, on projected insolvencies, we don't we don't really forecast that variable specifically uh, for small businesses. What I can comment on is that the impact on small businesses is again largely due to that factor that you mentioned. Rent payments is uh, is is expected to be or has been larger uh, than what it has uh, been on on larger. On larger businesses now, the again the the the, the majority of sectors have uh, reopened, maybe not fully, but have reopened since the summer, and so uh, there is again based on anecdotal, for example, survey evidence uh, from CFIB or um, or other economic high frequency economic indicators, is an uptick in activity. Uh, in relation to uh, many of these businesses that um, that should help you know lessen some of that hit uh, so it, 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 a second um, a second wave of restrictions that is widespread would definitely elevate that risk uh, we haven't seen that yet uh, what we've seen is very targeted restrictions and in the example of Quebec for example more recently uh, the closures uh, that they enacted on uh, on restaurants and bars, they have set a specific timeline. And they said, I, I believe it was 28 days, um, and um, and so um, and so. While the outlook still uh, remains, it's not it's not 
it's not a very certain environment for businesses to invest um, from a business continuity and cash flow perspective. Some of the reopenings and the expectation that restrictions are not going to be as severe as March, April um, should help uh, alleviate some of that um, in the near term. Uh, now, of course, going forward, um, COVID-19 is a wild card. So there was always the potential that one sector may receive lasting um, renewed restrictions, in which case it would elevate the risk on small businesses in that sector. That's not our base case, base case assumption as of yet, um, but it is, of course, uh, still a wild card and heavily dependent, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, a full return to pre-pandemic levels of activity is very heavily dependent on uh, on resolution around the virus, whether it's a vaccine or uh, or um, or uh, or improved treatment um, and that would elevate that uh, uh, that would um, remove that elevated uncertainty that businesses are facing. Um, so again, like on that note, business investment is. Uh, you know, experiencing a slower rebound than consumer spending in our in our forecast, largely because of that, again, unprecedented uncertainty with respect to uh, reopenings and potential renewed restrictions and the global backdrop in general and other countries, for example, facing their own restrictions, reducing external demand. Um, so, so, yeah, I'm sorry if my answer is not a very clear cut. Uh, uh, we, we don't we don't have uh, any, um, we don't embed any uh, spike um, in, um, in, uh, in, you know, business. We don't forecast that variable specifically, to be honest. Um, but we do expect that some of these reopenings are going to help in the near term, uh, at least. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you so much, Omar. Um, it's now 9.30. Very briefly before we wrap up, I do want to ask one other question. Um, as you know, many, if not all of us on the call today watched with avid and great interest the presidential debate on Tuesday evening. Um, so we've already experienced a global pandemic in 2020 and we're now moving into a, a, an election south of the border, uh, which obviously could have very profound impacts on our economic outlook, depending upon the outcome. Very briefly, can you share with us any thoughts you might have about what a Biden presidency might have in store for us, or alternatively, what the effects on our economic outlook might be if, if President Trump is reelected? Um, of course, so I will offer. I will offer the, the perspective in terms of like, um, depending on which candidate gets uh, gets elected, we don't expect the um, the impact on Canada to be. Um, I mean, and, that, and that's considering uh, the COVID nineteen backdrop uh, to be uh, that significant. So there are several fronts that would impact Canada. One is um, taxes. So depending on which candidate wins the election, the tax structure, uh, specifically corporate taxes in the US uh, may change. Um, if they do increase, uh, that would be uh, from Canada's perspective, uh, a boost to Canada's competitiveness uh, because in relative terms, Canada's corporate taxes uh, would uh, become more attractive if corporate taxes in the US um, are uh, raised from their current level. So that's one area. Um, uh, there is um, there is another area uh, which is uh, the the energy sector. Uh, that's one area where the two candidates would uh, would potentially differ significantly, specifically with respect to um, a potential pipeline construction um, in Canada that is cross jurisdictional, so it requires U.S. approval as well. And, um, and there, that's one area where both candidates would like to deviate in terms of the decision. Um, so, or potentially at least. Uh, so, so in terms of the impact on Canada, that would be the direct impacts on Canada. Those would be the two areas to focus on. That is corporate taxes, um, the differences in corporate tax uh, plans across the two candidates. 
Um, and again, if corporate taxes are raised, that would be a net positive for, in the U.S., that would be a net positive. Um, and the energy sector is uh, another area. And of course, the global backdrop, um, uh, that's a different story. Uh, so I, uh, um, in that sense, I'm just focusing on what the, uh, the direct impacts from, uh, from the election saddle border would be on Canada. Great. Thank you, Omar. So uh, notwithstanding the global pandemic and the crisis that we're all managing, it's it's one more major event this year for all of us to keep our eyes on. So on behalf of the Burlington Chamber, I want to thank you, Omar, for making yourself available to us today, for sharing your insights, and sincere thanks to TD for hosting this morning's session. Uh, for those of you who may want to join us for part two, I just wanted to confirm that uh, Eye on the Economy, our next episode is planned for the morning of October the 30th. We're going to be featuring the Realtors Association of Hamilton Burlington, and we're going to be unpacking the impact of COVID-19 on real estate markets. So yet another very interesting episode planned for later this month. So thank you again to everyone for joining us. Many thanks to TD and to Omar for being here today, and I hope everyone has a terrific day. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, Thanks, Carla.